Good evening, everyone. In the event of any emergency, there are two exits at the front and one at the back. We don't have any, any plans for any emergencies tonight. Uh, getting feedback from somewhere. Uh, the, if you have a mobile phone or a pager, please turn it off or set it to silence unless you're a medic on call. The format for this evening, uh, in a moment I'll introduce our speaker. We'll give us a presentation. At the end of that presentation, there'll be a very short break for those who need to leave for, to catch trains or whatever. Then we'll have a question and answer session and followed by the presentation of the Kelvin Medal by our president. Today's speaker is Professor Saifel Islam, who is the is Professor of Material Science at the University of Oxford. Many of you, or some of you, hopefully, will have seen him before on television. In 2016, he gave the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures. And possibly you will remember the very first one was dramatic, where the lecture theatre was all dark, started with a candle, and then powered up the lights over time. Uh, so if you remember that lecture, that's tonight's speaker. <laughs> he uh, grew up in North London. Uh, he got BSc in chemistry and a PhD from University College London. Following his uh, doc doctoral studies, he was a postdoctoral uh, fellow at, so I'm getting feedback from somewhere. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so uh, postdoctoral fellow at Eastman Kodak uh, in Rochester in New York in the United States. He spent 16 years at Bath University, uh, working with the Energy Materials Research Group, before joining Oxford in January this year. He is a patron of Humanist UK, uh, a trustee of the RSC, the Royal Society for Chemistry, an expert panel member for the Faraday Institution. He has, um, he's in the Guinness Book of World Records. I won't tell you why just now. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he's received uh, and been offered several other awards, including in 2022, the Royal Society Hughes Medal. In 2020, the American Chemical Society Award in Energy Chemistry. In 2019, he declined an OBE. And I'm very pleased to say that he has accepted the invitation to present tonight's <laughs> Kelvin Medal <laughs> Lecture. <laughs> So speaking on making a materials difference to green energy, batteries included, I'll speak tonight, Professor Seifel Israel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, what an introduction. Um, I'm gonna start with thank yous and then a confession. I think a confession is appropriate since we're in a, an old church. Uh, so the thank yous are for that lovely and generous introduction from Grant, and also the initial invitation from Pat and Grant from the society. I've never given a talk to a philosophical society before, so uh, I was a bit daunted about accepting this invitation. And the final thank you is to you, for all of you for coming out on a chilly evening to hear me talk about material science. The confession is I actually quite nervous about this lecture. Um, I'm used to giving a conference talk, uh, a research seminar, but I wasn't sure about the audience. I wasn't sure about the level to pitch it. I know there are top professors in science, in physiology, uh, top scientists in terms of PhDs in physics, mathematics. I've got society members, and I've got lots and lots of non-scientists. So I wasn't sure about the content, so I asked Pat, what shall I talk about? And she said, about 50 minutes. So for the next 54 minutes, I'm going to give you a, a talk about making a materials difference to green energy, batteries included. So let's get your glasses on. So for the, for the, it's as in politics, red is on the left and where my heart is. Uh, so for the best effect, if you stare and move your heads side to side, um, then you, you get the best effect. And even if that doesn't work, it makes me smile from this side. But anyway, those images 
are images of crystalline materials. The one on the left I'm going to come on to, the one on the right is related to well, the well-known buckyball. Um, and I don't know whether Sir Harry Croto was one of your previous speakers, the Nobel laureate. So since I'm going to give you a flavor of material science, let me give you the menu for the talk. And the menu, if this works as usual, No, it's, it's in, the dongle is in. Should be in. Oh. It was working earlier. That's a shame. As ever, we've had mic problems and now. Well, I'll. Well. Maybe that's it. Yes, it builds up the suspense. Thank you. That was deliberate. Uh, so let, let me go through the lecture menu. So the starter is I'm going to give you the context of my talk, which is materials and models. Um, and then the next, the main course is to do with lithium battery materials. And I'm gonna to talk to you about what, what materials are in the, your lithium ion battery, but more importantly, how can we improve those materials? For dessert, or I suppose a link to the main course, solar, I work on solar materials as well. What's new about solar? And then as a dessert, I thought I'd give you a couple of slides about my journey. How did I get to Oxford? A little tiny kid from London, how did I get to Oxford? And if life gives you lemons, you, what do you do with them? Um, I'm also gonna start off a new controversy about Shakespeare. Was Shakespeare a chemist? And as with um, mentioned earlier, I'm gonna turn your devices off. So let me start off with the context. I think it's well established that the energy challenge is one of the greatest issues of our time. It's a very hot topic, uh, both literally and metaphorically, and it's to do with the burning of fossil fuels and the increase in CO2 emissions, and that is leading to climate change. Um, there are alternatives, and the future will be an energy mix. There will still be fossil fuels, but can we wean ourselves off burning fossil fuels to get to minimize CO2 emissions. So there'll be wind power, there'll be solar, there might be wave, and we can do our bits in terms of energy efficiency and energy saving. So what do I work on? Well, arguably, energy storage and energy conversion are more important now than any time in human history. So I work on energy storage, which is essentially batteries, and energy conversion, solar so we're converting light to electricity but what's important about both of those technologies is that material science is key um, if we want major advances or major breakthroughs we need new materials underpinning science and a greater scientific understanding and that in a way sums up my research philosophy and the next slide in a way i I sort of wanted to give a philosophical slide. It relates to my research philosophy. And it's a quote from one of the greatest of scientific thinkers at the moment, and that's Steven Pinker from Harvard University. And he's written a book that I recommend very highly, Enlightenment Now. And there's a re really lovely quote very early on in his book. And he says, as a sentient being, you can refine your faculty of reason by learning and debating. You can seek explanations of the natural world through science and insight into the human condition through the arts and humanities. And I very much agree with that. And that's a really lovely quote from Steven Pinker and sums up some of my research philosophy too. So crystal gazing on the atomic scale. 
Um, so what kind of materials do I look at? Well, essentially we live in a crystalline world. Uh, one of the best examples is are in your kitchen right now, and that is salt. Uh, they have these beautiful cubic crystals, and they're the stuff that you sprinkle on your chips, on your pasta, and in my case, before a tequila shot. Uh, so let's get your 3D glasses on. So this is, this is actually the title slide, one of the images in the title slide. So this is sodium chloride on the atomic scale. And it shows us a very cubic structure. The large spheres are chloride ions and the small spheres are sodium ions. And you can see it's a very regular structure. And that's a very typical of crystals that have a very regular crystal structure in three dimensions. It's repeated in three, just like a wallpaper pattern in 2D or a, a design on a dress in 2D. This is repeated in three dimensions. So those are the kind of crystalline materials I look at. A very important property of these materials that I'm looking at is that some of these materials conduct ions. Ions can travel through these crystalline materials. Most of the atoms or ions stay where they are, but some ions move. So if you look at this image and shake your head about, you'll see this. Give us an ooh. Ooh, yeah, thank you. So that iron motion is very important for the operation of batteries, which I'll explain later on. Batteries rely on iron conduction, but often complex materials are very difficult to um, disentangle or too complex to find out how, the, how those ions move. Actually, I find that image quite mesmerizing, so I'm going to do that again, but in triplets, yeah. Yes, thank you. Give us a response. Just to at least tell me that you're awake. Uh, so that's so the pathways are clear. I'll show you that through modeling, we can understand how iron conduction works. Right. Um, another important aspect of crystals is that they're not perfect. This is a lovely quote from Sean Corrish, a colleague at Trinity College Dublin. He said, like people, like all of us, like people, solids are imperfect, making them unique and interesting. And I love this painting on the left uh, by Salvador Dali. It's called Galatea of Spheres because it blends a human image with spheres. It looks like a crystal image. And it also reminds me that good science shares the, the kind of wonder and beauty of fine arts and the humanities. Um, so why do crystals have defects? What's to do with entropy? Um, entropy is like a, a teenager's bedroom. There's a tendency towards disorder. And that disorder is in a closed system and it's the second law of thermodynamics. And very important slide in the next slide explains who was involved in formulating the second law. The next quote is from me. Like solids, some people have more defects than others. I can't, I can't possibly comment on those two hairstyles. All I can say that my, my wife said that my major defect is dodgy puns and dodgy dad jokes, which you'll hear more of later on. So I'm, I'm actually very honored, delighted, and very surprised to be awarded the Kelvin Medal. And there is a link to that defect slide. Um, so William Thompson, who later became Lord Kelvin, I discovered he was the first scientist to be ennobled. Uh, he was the professor of natural philosophy here at the University of Glasgow for 53 years. Um, he was so well-renowned, he was, he was offered posts all over around the world, but he decided to stay at the University of Glasgow. He was president of this society, your society. He was also president of that other society called the Royal Society, but we don't talk about them. Uh, and, but more importantly, he actually helped to formulate the first and second law of thermodynamics. For those who don't know the second law of thermodynamics, shame on you. Uh, 
as C.P. Snow said in his 50s, 1950s book, there is a clash of cultures. The humanities expect scientists to know about Shakespeare, but the humanities should know about the second law of thermodynamics. Um, Kelvin, as we all know, is well known for the temperature scale. So absolute zero is zero, zero Kelvin. But he was involved with so many other areas. He was a real polymath and I would say a real true professor of natural philosophy. So I'm very honored to have an award named after him. Um, another important defect before I move on to the main course is to do with impurities in crystals. And that is, yep, it's the one. Um, the beautiful gemstones that we wear and we admire are actually defective. Those colors are impurities within those crystals. Um, so in, in effect, those beautiful, beautiful emeralds or rubies are defective. Another good example is from uh, Walter White and the crystal meth he used to make in Breaking Bad. I think for TV effect, his stuff was blue, but the real stuff that I make is actually crystal clear. So it should be clear. So let me move on to what I do. So when I, um, when I go to parties, um, that's when I get invited, that is. Uh, in invitations seem to dry up when you mention you're a professor in materials chemistry. Um, but when I do get invited and they say, Cypher, what do you do? Rather than saying I'm a professor, I sometimes say I model. Uh, but but I, don't, I don't model down the catwalk. I am modeling on a computer. So why do we need modeling? And this is scientific modeling rather than obviously the type down the catwalk. Um, first of all, modeling is a bridge between pure theory and experiment. And I'll give an example, a very good example in a second. But also modeling is very important in understanding complexity. Complexity, not just crystalline materials, but complexity of um, weather patterns, whatever modeling is involved with. Complexity is very important to understand. And also it gives you new insights. In my area, those ions moving I showed you early on, it's very difficult to probe that on the atomic scale from experiment alone. And that's where modeling can be very, very powerful. So modeling to me is the sort of yin and yang of science. You've got materials modeling very much tied up with experiment. So all the work I do is in collaboration with experimentalists. So, um, and that's the beauty of science. We all collaborate, we link up with fellow colleagues. And so the experimental techniques would be synthesis, making the compound, understanding the structure, which is diffraction and microscopy, and then using a whole raft of other techniques to understand those materials um, in greater detail. And modeling complements that greatly. So one of the best example of modeling bridging theory and experiment is this iconic photo of James Watson and Francis Crick in Cambridge in 1953. They were working out the structure of the molecule of life, DNA, which up to then, there was a considerable debate. In fact, it was a competition with Linus Pauling. And they discovered that the structure was a double helix. And they used modeling techniques, except they used clamps and retort stands. And they relied on diffraction data, the infamous photo 51 from Rosalind Franklin. Sadly, Rosalind died of ovarian cancer before the Nobel Prize was awarded, because I believe that she rightly deserved to get the Nobel Prize together with Watson and Crick. But nowadays, you can do this within a minute or so on a modern computer. You can build up those kind of computer models, and that is shown on the right, that double helix, the molecule of life. This also illustrates the importance of fundamental curiosity-driven research. Watson and Crick wanted to find out the structure of DNA, but by working out that it's a double helix, it had major impacts on modern biology in terms of replication and what that means for uh, uh, genetics and a whole range of other areas of biology. 
So finally, on this modeling section, um, I wanted to show you modeling is not just on the atomic scale, but can actually be on a very large scale. Um, you often hear about modeling related to, say, climate, uh, and that's meteorological modeling. I wanted to show you modeling of materials. So up on the um, uh, vertical axis is the length scale. Along the um, horizontal axis is the time scale. So we could start off in very small, you know, microseconds or even femtoseconds in terms of time scale. And the length scale is usually just nanometers. So I work on the bottom left as a chemist. I'm looking at atoms and electrons. We also look at the next scale up, which is grains, the grains and particles of those materials. And then lastly, when we want to look at a, a solar device or a, a battery device, you can go into device modeling. And that's very much engineering modeling, what we call continuum type modeling. But there's lots of links between all three. And the current buzzword is in terms of linking and using large amounts of data is artificial intelligence and machine learning. And there's, there is a tre tremendous amount of potential in using such techniques in modeling. So let me move on to, first of all, the science controversy. And that relates to not the, um, not the Scottish play, um, but Midsummer Night's Dream. When Demetrius wakes up to see Helena for the first time, he utters these words. He says, to what shall I compare thine eye? Crystal is muddy. What Shakespeare is trying to say here is compared to Helena's beautiful eyes, crystals contain ionic impurities. So you've heard it from me first. I've started a new controversy. Not only was Shakespeare a brilliant writer, he was also a materials chemist back then. So let me move on to the energy storage, lithium ion battery. Um, so it's well established that the lithium ion battery has really powered the portable revolution. So when I went to concerts back in the 1980s and 90s, seeing the Smiths or New Order or Glaswegian bands like Bell and Sebastian and Orange Juice, um, that's what the audience looked like. Now, if you go to see Billie Eilish or Coldplay or uh, Beyonce, uh, the audience looks like that. And they're not really mobile phones. They are mini supercomputers. If you think about the power of that device, it's astonishing that that device is probably more powerful than most of the computers that sent the Apollo rocket to the moon in the late 1960s. In fact, I, did, I asked my group to look at the power of the Cray computer that I used during my PhD in the mid 1980s. And the power of the iPhone, current for iPhone, is 40 times more powerful than the Cray 1S. And that Cray 1S served the whole of University of London. So just imagine somebody logging on to your iPhone from the whole of Glasgow, and it's like that. So why lithium ion? So this shows a plot. The y-axis, the vertical axis, is what is called volumetric energy density. It's basically how much energy you can store in the unit volume, basically the size. Along the horizontal axis is the specific energy density, and that gives you how much energy you can store within the unit mass, basically how heavy your battery is. And you can see on the bottom left is the humble lead acid battery, large but reliable. Then you go to nickel cadmium, nickel metal hydride, and right on the top right is lithium ion. So lithium ion is the lightest and the smallest of your rechargeable batteries. That's because lithium itself is, after helium and hydrogen, is the third smallest and lightest element in the periodic table. So lithium is well, um, is, you know, well characterized for that use. But nowadays, what's the challenge? If I said portable electronics was a big success, the challenge now is that can we go beyond the current electric vehicle batteries? And that's because two important stats. Road transport in the developed world accounts for 30% of 
of CO2 emissions. And sadly, that's set to rise because of the greater car ownership in China, India, Brazil, and elsewhere. So we need to wean ourselves off the internal combustion engine. Another interesting statistic is, uh, this is to do with range anxiety. 90% of UK car journeys are less than 40 miles. In fact, 50%, one in two, are less than five miles. The, the school run, the supermarket journey, um, even some daily commutes tend to be less than 40 miles. So actually this, this idea that you want your electric car to go from Glasgow to London one, in one drive, that's really just a very few journeys. But anyway, people are wanting longer range vehicles. So there's a big green light for electric vehicles. Um, nearly every night, there are TV adverts to do with electric vehicles. Every car manufacturer is looking at them. And so you've got the most successful hybrid on the top left, the Toyota Prius, the well-known Tesla, BMW i3, there's a Nissan Leaf, and there's a whole range of others as well. On the right, I, I show the, the figure on the right, not because I'm a, a motor engineer or even a watcher of Top Gear, but I just love this label, which I wanted to sh share with you. Battery recharge plug, not to scale. Imagine that kind of large battery plug in the battery of your car. So anyway, um, some of you might say, Cypher, what's inside a lithium-ion battery? And I say, that's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure I can give you a good answer, but I'll try. So inside a lithium-ion battery is basically an electrochemical sandwich. And like any sandwich, there are two bread slices. Um, the bread slices are electrodes. Um, on the left is the positive electrode, which is the lithium cobalt oxide cathode, which is another name for a positive electrode. On the right, the bread slice is a, a graphite anode, a negative electrode. And you can see they're both layered structures, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. And like any sandwich, you need a good sandwich filling. So the meat, or hummus if you're vegetarian or vegan, uh, is a good lithium ion conductor, in this case, a lithium salt in an organic solvent. So it's a liquid electrolyte. So how does it work? So when you're at home tonight and you plug in your phone or iPad, whatever, you're going to see some chemistry in action. Basically, you're giving electrons from the mains and you're charging it. And that's what that green symbol is. And the lithiums are moving from the positive electrode to the negative electrode. When you discharge your battery, i.e. when you use your battery, the lithium ions are going the other way, but releasing electrons and powering your device. So that's why it's rechargeable. It can go both ways between charging and recharging uh, and discharging. But there is a problem on the bottom left, cobalt. We need to move away from cobalt. It's toxic. It's expensive, and there are issues to do with um, mining. So there are ethical concerns with mining, particularly in, in, in the Republic of Congo. So um, in this area, eventually, because it's long overdue, the godfather, as I call it, the godfather of this field, John Goodenough, was finally given the Nobel Prize. He's the old, oldest Nobel laureate. He's at 97. For those who aren't sure, John Goodenough is the one on the left. The one on the right is a, a president who believed in science and the scientific method. Um, John Goodenough did his pioneering work in Oxford in the 1980s, but then uh, after the late 80s moved back to Texas, where, where he still is. And he reached 100 this year, uh, amazingly. Um, the other award winners are Standing Whittingham in um, SUNY Binghamton in New York and Akira Ushino in Maiko University in Japan. So that was long overdue and it was great that they got the, the prize. I lead um, a project within the Farad Institution. So the Farad Institution is funding significant amount of research in the battery area. Um, it's strapline is batteries for Britain. Uh, but really, it's about trying to develop a manufacturing base 
that is sadly lost within the UK in the area of batteries. And I'm working on that positive electrode, that cathode, because it's the biggest hurdle for high energy density. If you want to store more energy in your battery, if you want your phone to last a week or a month, we need to store more energy. And that's what we're working on. So the project I'm leading is called Next Generation Lithium Ion Cathode Materials, called CATMAT. Uh, and we've got a website if you're interested. So let me get, or oh, oh, before the 3D uh, images, I need to um, introduce some building blocks. And I apologize for the heading. The name is Bond, Chemical Bond. Um, so these building blocks are basically a metal ion in blue. And for those keen followers of solid state chemistry, we'll know that the oxygens are in red. On the top left, it's connected to six oxygens. And on the right, you can represent it by an octahedron in orange. I wanted to show that because it's significant for the 3D images. On the bottom left is a tetrahedral arrangement where the metal ion is connected to four oxygens. And you can represent that by a, a, a pyramid type structure. So on with your 3D glasses. This, this is in your phone right now. This is the here, I should get my atom. Here we have, we have the lithium ion cathode material. And you can see, I hope you can see those octahedra are connected to other octahedra by their edges. And because they're connected by their edges, they make these lovely layered or sheet-like structures between which are the lithium ions, which are the spheres. So you can imagine the lithium ions coming out between those layers and between those sheets. So that as you charge and discharge your phone. So as in life, the important stuff is happening between the sheets. <laughs> I did warn you, that's, uh, I did warn you. So, so that's the lithium, but we need to move away from cobalt. So if you look at the bottom, that's the formula for lithium cobalt oxide. Um, we're replacing cobalt with nickel and manganese. Nickel and manganese are more abundant. We're minimizing the cobalt. That's often abbreviated as NMC. So hopefully when you hear about NMC, which all car manufacturers are using, you'll know what I'm talking about. That's basically lithium, nickel, manganese, cobalt oxide, NMC. But we're trying to increase the energy density. And one way of increasing the energy density is stuffing more lithium into the structure. And that's what we're doing. We're calling it lithium rich NMC. We're basically putting nickel into those cobalt sheets. And that's what we're working on now. And hopefully you hear more about that in the next five years, these lithium rich NMC materials that may be adopted within um, some of the gigafactories that we have in the UK. Keep your 3D glasses on. If we can move away from um, cobalt, the best way, let's move on to an element that is very abundant, iron. iron is very abundant. It's one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. Obviously it's in rust, so you can make a battery out of rust. Even if you're not a structural chemist, you can see straight away, if you move, you shake your head about a bit, that structure is very different from the one I've just shown you. This is a beautiful mineral structure called olivine. The iron octahedra are connected to those tetrahedra, those pyramids as phosphates, and the lithium ions are in yellow coming out of the screen. So this is lithium ion phosphate, and it's seen as the X factor at the moment. Um, Tesla, Elon Musk, are possibly going to use that in the next generation Tesla materials. So this is the lithium ion phosphate material. And I'm going to talk about how the ions move in that material just in a second. Keep your 3D glasses on. This you may not, may not believe, but this is actually a test vehicle within our consortia. We've used this test vehicle linked with the University of Strathclyde, this beautiful Bond-like car, AC Cobra. And as you can see from what they're wearing, 
Um, it was a relatively warm day in Glasgow that day. Sorry. <laughs> um, so this isn't 3D, but if you want to keep them on, um, this is how we model ion diffusion. So this is an animation of lithium ions moving through that layered structure. The blues are cobalt, the reds are oxygen, and the lithium ions are in green. And you can see we're modeling and confirming that lithium ions move in 2D between those sheets of cobalt and oxygen. But more importantly, we can actually derive quantitative information, how fast the lithiums move. Can we change the material or composition and increase how fast the lithium has moved, because that's directly related to the charge rate. How fast you charge your phone is directly related to how fast those lithium ions move through the crystal structure. So this is the lithium ion phosphate in 2D, and I've shown you the slice through the structure. The yellow is the iron octahedra, and the blue are the phosphate tetrahedra. From our modeling, we predicted to our surprise that the lithium ions do not move in a linear path. In fact, we shouldn't be surprised when we go walking uh, you know, within the beautiful um, countryside around Scotland or the Lake District or whatever, we don't walk in a linear path. We go through some very curved paths and that's what's happening here. We're predicting that the lowest energy path is a curved path. And we predicted this for modeling. No experiment saw this until we collaborated with a group in Japan. So they did some very elegant diffraction studies in Tokyo. And from their diffraction studies, they showed that the lithium path contour shown in blue was indeed one dimensional, but a curved path. But what was even nicer is that we found that it was very nice quantitative agreement with our predicted positions. So that was a really nice illustration where computer modeling can predict a mechanism, a complex mechanism, before experiment has shown it explicitly. Before I move on, uh, one area that would obviously be a question, and is often the question in this area, is the challenge of recycling of batteries. The three R's at the top left, we should all be thinking about in, in terms of any product, whether it's plastic, et cetera, is reduce, reuse if possible, and recycle. Um, it's been done through legislation for the lead acid batteries. I think more than 90% of lead acid batteries have to be recycled or reused. Um, we need to reduce the amount of cobalt, as I've mentioned. We need to move over to earth abundant elements like iron and manganese, and we definitely need legislation. Um, um, I fear the EU will be ahead of us. Now we've got the B word. Uh, so legislation is very much needed to promote it. This shows a schematic. I'll try and this is part of a, a project from the Foreign Institution called Relib. It's a recycling project. It's not my area of expertise. You may have some questions, but it's not my expertise. But we should be thinking about design for recycling. From raw materials, number one, active materials, two, battery manufacturing, three, end of life, four, and then recycling, five. So hopefully there'll be more of that. And unfortunately, it hasn't been happening with our mobile devices because there hasn't been a uh, I think strict enough legislation or economic incentive, but that will happen with cars. So what about beyond lithium ion? Um, I work on things moving away from lithium ion. Lithium ion has the issue of resources um, around the world. And there is one example, and you're not, you're not coming here without, not do, without doing some work. I'm going to get you to do some work. Um, so, if you hadn't heard it before, you have now. There are something called sodium batteries. 
So sodium is beyond lithium. In fact, strictly speaking, it's below lithium in the periodic table. And so there is a competition between lithium and sodium. As I said, sodium is below lithium in the periodic table. So that's a strong hint. I'm going to ask you within one minute to introduce yourself to your neighbor if you don't know them already and debate this question, these two questions. What are the advantages of sodium versus lithium? And what are the disadvantages versus lithium? Even if you don't know, there might be somebody next to you who might know, but also it starts the debate and it might even stir some brain cells. And that's very important in terms of getting you to engage with this talk. So for the next minute, start debating advantages and disadvantages of sodium versus lithium. Good. Right. I think I have enough time. Right. It's good to hear some vigorous debate. Thank you very much. You could be talking about what's, what you're having for dinner tonight. I don't know what you're talking about. But uh, let's see. Um, obviously, uh, some of the answers you may have not, might not be included here, and we can carry on with the discussion. But the main, I thought I'd list two in each, and hopefully they came up. The first one is sodium is more abundant than lithium. Um, um, hands up, you thought, came up with that one? Yes. So sodium is actually the sixth most abundant element in the Earth's crust. And that means it's got a lower cost uh, than lithium. The disadvantage, it's got a greater mass and size than sodium, which means that the amount you can store in the unit volume or unit, or unit mass is lower than lithium. So it's got a lower energy density. So it's unlikely that sodium will be in your phone very soon, but it doesn't exclude other applications. And the other applications are storage electricity grid. So when the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, we do need energy storage, the electricity grid, especially when we're getting more and more renewables into our grid. The other area, interestingly, is to do with um, lighter and shorter range electric vehicles. For example, e-scooters. So there's a company called NIU or NU, and there's a company called Faradium who are developing these sodium ion batteries. So as I said, you've heard, if you haven't heard, have heard about them before, you have now. So watch out for sodium ion batteries. So this is a, a brief TV break before I move on to solar, and that's to do with the Christmas lectures. Um, I was very much honored, surprised and privileged to be asked to deliver the Christmas lectures. I grew up watching them, uh, like most of us. We only had two or three channels to watch in the 70s and 80s, and I, uh, my mum and dad got us to watch the Christmas lectures every Christmas. And interestingly, the first Christmas lectures were televised in 1936, close to where I grew up, in Alexandra Palace. Um, I grew up in a place called Crouch End, which I'll mention in a second. Anyway, um, I should say that they were the most stressful thing I've ever done. I, um, I didn't have any gray hairs before I did the Christmas lectures, but they were very, very stressful. Um, they were founded and kick-started by one of my scientific heroes, Michael Faraday, who uh, was on the back of one of the old 20 pound notes. And you can see on the bottom left, him giving one of his Christmas lectures within the infamous Faraday Lecture Theater. He's one of my scientific heroes because not only was a, a fantastic scientist, but he came from a very humble background. His father, I think, was a blacksmith. He didn't go to Eton College, um, and he was largely self-taught, and he rose to be one of the greatest scientists that ever lived. Um, so it's a, it's a great honor to actually follow, you know, to be on the list of Christmas lectures with Faraday being the number one. I should introduce this. So the next bit, my lectures had, I thought were a really nice intro to the slides. They were, they were beautifully filmed. And this is the intro 
And I think the sound is, as you can hear, the sound is there. And it's called Supercharged, my lectures. <laughs> Right. Uh, um, oh, I should say a bit about that cake. Because I gave them in 2016, they were the 80th anniversary um, Christmas lectures, and that's why they picked the theme of energy um, linked to Faraday. Because they're the 80th anniversary, I could invite Christmas lecturers past. So if you haven't watched them, um, again, shame on you, uh, but they're online, and within the first 10 minutes of the lecture one, you see Richard Dawkins. Um, he reprises um, one of the demos that he did back in 1979, and I repeat, uh, so you have to watch it to see it. Um, when life gives you lemons, in my case, I make a lemon battery. So we use the lemon just to show that uh, a battery consists of two electrodes, in this case, a copper nail and a magnesium strip or a zinc nail, and you can generate a voltage. It's a school experiment. But I said to the Royal Institution, I wanted to go large, very large. So we got, so I got my group to buy 1,008 lemons. And because there were 2016 Christmas, I cut them in half to get 2016 lemon slices. So this was true cutting edge technology. And um, the group said that they put the, the wires together, but it said that wasn't the tough part, Cypher. The tough part was putting the IKEA shelving together. <laughs> so we actually broke a Guinness World Record. We generated 1,275 volts. However, however, thank you. But, but, however, two years later, um, a group in Denmark broke our record. So I'm not, I'm not saying I felt sour or bitter about that. <laughs> but I wanted that record back. So last year, the Royal Society of Chemistry approached me just before COP26 um, here in Glasgow. They said, we want to do something for the Royal Society of Chemistry outreach. And I said, quick as a flash, I want my record back. Uh, so, so with the Royal Society of Chemistry, we used, we squeezed out a record 2,304 volts from 3,000 lemons. So if you want a good Christmas present, we're in the 2023 20, Guinness World Records manual right now. And before you ask, some of you may ask, that they, what did you do with those 3,000 lemons? Well, the first 10 was gin and tonics for me. Uh, but the rest, we went responsibly processed by uh, ReFood, which is based in Widnes, and they generated biofuel from our... 2,900 and whatever, uh, 80, 90 lemons bar the gin and tonics. So anyway, I've got a world record. Uh, anyway, let's move on to the last bit, solar energy. Uh, for those Smiths fans, uh, there is a light that never goes out, and that is the sun. So these are the last of the 3D images. Um, I can see a few people still got my world. I think you've fallen asleep, haven't you? You're hiding behind those. So this is a nuclear reactor. This nuclear reactor is conveniently placed 150 million kilometers from us, or 93 million miles. And it's not, uh, some people have said it's not the best 3D image, but all of us know what the sun looks like, but it's, it gives you an idea of the 3D image. Um, but an interesting stat, the amount of sunlight that hits the Earth's surface in 90 minutes is about the entire world's energy consumption for one year. Isn't that amazing? So basically, we've got to harness that nuclear reactor. And people ask me, why do I work on solar? And that's because of what I call the Willie Sutton principle. Willie Sutton was a, a famous bank robber in the 19th century in the US. He stole from many, many banks until he got caught. And he was asked when he got caught by a journalist, why did you rob so many banks? And he said, 
that's where the money is. So I work, I work in solar because that's where the energy is. And so what's happening? So um, the current material is basically related to another crystalline in the world, and that's silica. So it's basically sand, which obviously grains in the palm of our hand. We can see these minute, beautiful crystals. And that's what silica is. That silica structure, those pyramids, are silicon dioxide connecting at the corners. But from that, we make silicon. And silicon is connected again at the corners to form this beautiful, very robust, strong, and stable structure, unlike the government in the last few weeks. Uh, sorry. So this connected. So if you replace silicon by carbon, you get. When you replace silicon by carbon, you get diamond. Thank you. So diamond, obviously, one of the hardest and toughest structures. So silicon is a stable structure, and that dominates the panels. So we want to move away from, we don't have to move away from silicon. Silicon has been successful, but it has its disadvantages, partly because of energy cost in making it. So we want to move on to some low cost material. And this is based on the most topical material in the solar cell field, perovskite. So if you're gonna take a few words away from my lecture, please take away the word perovskite. It's a naturally occurring mineral. It's named after Count Lev Perovsky, um, who discovered it, or with other scientists, in the Urals mountains of Russia. But you can make it in the lab. We're not relying on Russian sources before people ask. This is the structure. You've got these corner, these um, octahedra sharing corners um, of titanium oxygen octahedra to form this beautiful 3D structure. And between those octahedra, you've got these large ions, in this case, calcium. So this is a naturally occurring mineral. Why is it topical? The next image is the synthetic perovskite that is the hottest material in the solar field. This is called organic inorganic perovskite. I'll give you its full name at the bottom. It's a bit of a mouthful, methyl ammonium lead iodide. But you can see it's got a similar structure. It's got those octahedra connected at the corners to form this beautiful 3D structure. But in this time, right in the middle, instead of a, a sphere, you've got this molecule, this organic cation, and that makes it different. It's a hybrid organic inorganic material. So that um, is the most topical perovskite, and I'll explain in a plot why it's the hottest material. The next one is the final 3D image, and it's a, a wake-up call. This, I might have to, the people watching on screen, I'm going to have to leave you for a second because I do love this image. If you move your head about, the antennae follow you around. It kind of wraps around. It's a bit scary. But it's a good wake-up call. That is a millipede, and that's the 3D image. Uh, so, yep. So if you weren't awake now, you should be now. Right. So that was the last 3D. So how does a solar cell work? Well, it's a bit like a sandwich um, that I showed you on the lithium-ion battery. And it works by what is called the photovoltaic effect. The sandwich... Um, has at the top a glass layer, then you've got a contact, then the absorber, which is this case the perovskite, but it can be silicon, that's to absorb the sunlight, and right at the bottom is the back contact. For those solar experts, I apologize for the simple schematic, but I just want to get across the photovoltaic effect. So what happens when you shine light, sunlight, is that you get those packets of energy, photons, they excite that absorber and they produce electrons. And when you get a flow of electrons, what do you get? You get electricity. So basically you're converting that solar energy to electrical energy, so you're getting electricity. 
but, but we don't do as well as nature. We don't get to 100%. So this plot explains why perovskites are very, very hot. This shows a plot of the, what is called the solar cell efficiency in percentage against the year of discovery. So it's basically the ratio of light in, electricity out. We would love to have 100%, but we don't. If you look at silicon, about 1985, it was about 15%. And then right now, it's touching 25%. So that is a single junction silicon cell. It shows you there hasn't been a massive improvement, unlike Moore's law for semiconductors. But look at the next plot, perovskite. Perovskite was discovered 2009. Within 12 years, it started from a, a poor 3%. Had, it's had this unprecedented rapid rise. It's unprecedented compared to any other material. Now going beyond single junction silicon, touching above 25%. That's not been seen by any other material. And that's why it's a very, very topical material. So let me explain a bit more about what this material is. There are some issues. So unlike silicon, Perovskites are much, much softer. And that's one of its disadvantages. So on the left, I'm showing you some computer modeling of this organic, inorganic perovskite. The, the purple atoms are iodide, the, the goldish are lead, and that molecule at the center is the methyl ammonium iron. And you can see there's a lot of motion, not only in the, the cation, the molecular iron, but also in the, the structure itself, the lead and iodide. The positive properties are that it's a good light absorber. It's easy to make. So that's why all labs are involved with it. It's easy to make compared to silicon. And it has a really good electronic properties. But its major, major disadvantage is stability, reflected by that dynamics, that dynamics modeling. It's actually an unstable material. So the, the stability has to improve. So this leads on to what's next. If it's unstable, well, basically, can we marry it with silicon? And the simple answer is yes. So in the news, you're going to hear more about what are called tandem cells. And as the name implies, tandem uses two absorbers. In this case, both perovskite and silicon. So it's basically the best of both worlds. It absorbs in different areas of the solar spectrum, so you get high efficiency. And it's on the left is a schematic of that sandwich with a perovskite cell and a silicon cell. And on the bottom right is a company that I'm working with. It's a startup in Oxford called Oxford PV. They are growing. In fact, next year, they've got a manufacturing site in Germany. So they're going to actually have online a manufacturing um, a manufacturing facility to generate these tandem cells from the end of next year to from 2024. So it's quite exciting to learn. You're going to hear more about these perovskite silicon tandem cells. So I'm going to present one more, one more scientific quote. It was a, a lovely quote that I saw at an exhibition by one of the other great scientific heroes of mine, Charles Darwin. And I went to an exhibition of his with my children, young children, at the Naturist Museum. The quote isn't from the great man. Um, it's actually from the French philosopher and writer Marcel Proust. But to me, it speaks to, speaks to me about science in general and materials modeling in particular. And hopefully it celebrates some of the younger scientists in the audience. And the quote is, the real voyage of discovery consists not only in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. So I think that's quite a strong quote. I'll end with a couple of slides, and I was asked to do this. I don't often, scientists don't often do this. So I thought, well, this is a, an unusual audience. So maybe I'll talk a, a couple of slides about my journey. So the kind of strap line is, who do you think you are? 
Um, I'll start off with life and education. Um, I grew up in a place called Crouch End. Um, so it's a bit like the East Enders, it's now Crouch Enders. Um, when I grew up there in the 70s and 80s, it was a quite a rough place, but now it's become quite trendy, as in many places in London. So now it's called Crouchond. Uh, um, I went to I went to a um, a comprehensive, a bog standard comprehensive school. Um, sadly, it wasn't a great school. In fact, um, it's, it was closed down in the 1980s. I'm not saying it was a, a a dangerous school, but it's one of those schools where they used to check for knives as you went in. Um, and if you didn't have one, they gave you one. Uh, um, I managed to escape and work uh, hard enough to my surprise and was accepted to do chemistry at University College London. Um, and again, to my surprise, stayed on to do a PhD. And here I should acknowledge my supervisor, uh, Professor Richard Catlow. And uh, he's my, a great mentor, um, champion, and our great friend. And um, I would honestly say that without his advice and support, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't be here where I am today without his kind of kind, generous support. After that, I was nudged into doing a fellowship, postdoc fellowship at Eastman Kodak in New York. Um, for those young ones in the audience, that is called photographic film. So we used to buy that from Boots, stick it into a camera, uh, take 24 or 36 photos, get it developed from Boots and find out that half of them were terrible. Um, obviously, the dirty word that's killed off Kodak and Fuji is the word digital. Um, I worked there in the late 80s and early 90s, so some of the heyday. I discovered a connection with Kelvin. So William Thompson, um, Lord Kelvin, was invited by George Eastman to be on the board, he's actually vice chairman of the board, at Kodak UK around 1899. I didn't know that, so I discovered that when reading up about Lord Kelvin. So another connection with Kodak. So life and career. Um, after Kodak, I, again, a lot of surprises. I would say that I've had more than my fair share of good fortune in my life. And uh, after my postdoc, I got a lectureship at University of Surrey in Guildford. And then at 41, I got a chair at University of Bath back in 2006. I didn't know what the term meant then, but I did feel it. Um, imposter syndrome. I was the only a professor of color in the department and in the faculty. And um, I felt like imposter, but obviously that dissipates very quickly because the beauty of the university environment is very collegiate and you feel very welcome straight away. Um, I couldn't be here without the support of family. Um, they basically tolerate my defects. Um, this is my wife, Gita, and this is Yasmin and Zach, what they looked like when I joined Bath. They were three and one, respectively. Now they're 20 and 18, respectively. Uh, I then, as I mentioned, was honored to do the RI Christmas lectures. And then this year, amazingly, uh, Oxford took me on and appointed me chair at, of material science in the Department of Materials and fellow at St. Anne's College. So this is probably my final chapter of my academic career, and it's a great honor to be there. Um, so I'm really enjoying myself. I've been there nine months, and it's been great fun. So concluding remarks. So future energy landscape. So there is one thing certain about the future, and that is it's uncertain. Uh, but I'm an eternal optimist. I'm always a uh, glass half full. And I think um, it's a very exciting time to be a scientist in general and a chemist in particular, because really I think we're at the dawn of a new era in low carbon energy. There's always ups and downs in politics and economics, but I, I'm a progressive that thinks there has been progress and I think there will be progress in low carbon energy. Scientists will contribute to this field and as has been shown by 
the pandemic, scientists have been critical in developing the vaccine and getting us through the COVID pandemic. And I think it will be very important in contributing to sustainable energy. So you've got these 3D glasses. If you fancy taking some selfies, then you're welcome to. If you're on social media, you can use my handle and the hashtag. Um, I've got others to do the same. Um, the figure in the middle is um, a lecture I gave to some school children. That group of boys, I think they've now formed a boy band. Uh, I think it, it's not One Direction. I think they're called Three Dimensions. And this, this other lot keep following me around. I don't know who they are, but they keep following me around. So they are there. I'm going to end with the F word. Um, it's not the F bomb, but it is the F bomb. Um, it's basically related to, as a university teacher, we're now asked to get some feedback from our students, from undergraduates, we get some feedback. So I got this feedback from one of my undergraduates and he or she said the following. If I had only one hour to live, I'd attend one of your lectures. However, 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 because it would feel like an eternity. On that note, thank you, thank you. Okay, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We have two microphone runners. Please don't ask the question until you've got the microphone and hold the microphone directly in front of your mouth like a pop star. It doesn't work if you hold it down there or somewhere. So directly in front of your mouth and um, start with the first question. Just on the left there. Thank you very much for a very enjoyable lecture. However, <laughs> did, <laughs> did it feel like an eternity? <laughs> pardon? <laughs> oh, it was like an eternity, but I enjoyed it. And as I'm now 80, I've not got much longer, I've only another 20 years to get my card. Anyway, uh, you mentioned storage in your opening gambit, and then you totally ignored it. And I would think that storage is much, 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 much more important. I've got solar panels and I'd like to store this energy, but storage is very expensive. So is this going to be cheaper now with tandem batteries? I disagree that I ignored it. Batteries are an energy storage device. So I talked about batteries, which is energy storage. And then I mentioned sodium, which is storing. So you would get a lithium pack in your home, a battery pack that would store your solar excess solar energy. At the moment, the reason why it's not used is it's, it's often to do with cost, it's economics. The technology is there. So I didn't ignore energy storage. <laughs> Uh, at the front, please. Thank you so much for your interesting lecture, Professor Islam. I, I'd like to kind of move out into the bigger picture, um, standing back a couple of lengths, really, to look at um, materials for uh, net zero 2050. And I mean, the figures that I've seen first of all, relating to batteries, um, for uh, battery vehicles, this is low power vehicles and uh, local buses only, nothing to do with, with HGV, long distance stuff, or ships or trains or any of that nature. 80, sorry, 65 terawatt hours of battery. Now, we don't have the resources identified anywhere in the world to produce the materials even for that. And for the gentleman behind me who's interested in sufficient storage to balance the grid, the figure that I have seen for that was 2,060 terawatt hours, which is a numbers that are almost imaginable in terms of cost and material availability. Now, I'm aware that uh, 
currently fossil fuels contribute 80% of the energy used by man. And 10 years ago, it was 81%. So by spending the, I think it's $3.7 trillion US dollars in that 10 years, we've managed to pull it down by 1%. So in order to hit this 2050, we need to spend approximately 12% of uh, annual GDP for the whole world for the next 30 years. Uh, I don't really see that happening. We are depending on people such as yourself to have fabulous breakthroughs to make this possible. Do you think it's possible? Uh, first of all, I'm not sure your figures from 81. To, if you look at just the UK electricity generation, you look at coal was used is about 98% around the Second World War, 1945. 98% was coal. Now it's touching less than 10%. So that figure you gave 80 to 80, that must be averaged over, oh, well, yeah. So, I'm, so there are pockets where there have been penetration of renewables and reduction in fossil fuels. So I am more optimistic than just looking at that global picture, because if you look at advanced, who would have thought 15 years ago that you'd be holding a mini supercomputer in your hand that can do that, what it can do. So we don't know what will happen in the next 10, 15 years into some of the developments on energy storage. So I, I think there are trends. If you look at just at the UK, the renewables now is towards 15, 20%. Nuclear is towards 15, 20%. Gas, similar amount, and coal has really come down. So I'm, I'm more optimistic than that global figure um if you look at just the uk obviously we'd like to translate that across the whole globe and that will take time that will take time i'm not saying that will be overnight it's the energy usage for extracting materials and processing materials we, we don't see any of in uh, the uk in western europe generally and um, this all happens now in, in the far east and, and the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, do you want the mic back? Oh, uh, that's, oh question on the, on the left, please. Uh, okay, thank you very much for the lecture. I think you pitched it about right, so no need to be nervous. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Andy Pearson from the Institution of Engineers in Scotland. I have a question about your perovskite material using methyl ammonium lead hydro, uh, iodide. That's lots of kind of toxic sounding yeah. words. Are we building a problem in the longer term with end of life and disposal of that, this material? No, that's a fair question. So um, so there are, because of time, we're, we're looking at materials moving away from lead. So tin is being developed. It, it's still not as highly efficient as the lead compounds. We do currently have, obviously, lead acid batteries. There'll be legislation, but you're right. In terms of future stability issues, we don't want that to have another environmental impact on lead. So we're move, trying to move away from lead in terms of tin perovskites. So that's being developed right now, but that is a fair issue. Um, so in terms of stability, the actual inorganic framework is very stable. So actually the leakage isn't from the iodine so much. Question at the front here, please. I, I fully accept what you say about the technology. I'm sure it can work. But I, oh, the question about the politics, the way it's actually put into practice, because it tends to be the politicians, in my opinion, let us down. Yeah. Um, one of the things that have gone wrong with, say, digital technology is the ability of certain large companies to patent various technologies and thereby get control, it, get control of it. Is that a problem with the sort of thing you're talking about? Well, I'm not an economist, so... Uh... Um, it's very hard, in a way that's kind of, anything to do with economics and politics is a difficult one to, to predict, and uh, it's very hard to say. You end up with very subjective and, and personal opinions, so I, I wouldn't know what, you know what would be the right answer there. There will be issues in terms of intellectual property, there'll be issues to do with the cost of materials and the cost of development. 
Um, and mm. as I mentioned or alluded to, there'll be the politics of legislation. Will the politicians get round to promoting recycling and in a way incentivizing recycling? Because there will be a cost element in recycling. Can we bring down the cost of recycling and other developments? Um, so I haven't fully answered your question, only because I don't know what the, the right answer is really on that one. Another question on the left, please. Thanks, Scott. I hate to mention an alternative and rival institution, but I saw in the CAM uh, an artificial leaf floating on the CAM, which was photosynth was using sunlight to photosynthesize and produce hydrogen. Yeah. Are you working on that in Oxford as well? I, there are other. I'm not personally, but that's an area called solar fuels. You're right. So that area of solar fuels is very interesting. That they're basically rather than using it as as I've shown here, as a photovoltaic, using it to generate electricity, you could use it actually to generate fuels as well. Uh, so that's being used, and uh, there's some excellent work at Cambridge and other places at Harvard uh, and MIT on that area. Yeah, in a way it is because it's an efficiency problem. I showed you that fact that silicon and proskites are still at about maximum 25 to 30% efficiency. So the efficiency of those solar fuels are similar or lower. So it's an efficiency. So we're not matching nature in that sense. Yeah. Okay, there's another question for Rose behind. Um, I know you realize you're in Scotland, but we don't have an awful lot of this nuclear energy source that you refer to. What we do have a lot of is wind. And you didn't mention wind, I don't think you did mention wind at all as a, as, a, as a power source. How do you see that fitting in with the general trend to lower carbon? And in particular, it brings us back to the storage issue. Um, and there's quite a lot going on in Scotland uh, related to that. In particular, I've mentioned one program that started and also another one that's being done in Korea and, um, and Norway where uh, vans are going up into the, or to wherever the wind is jet blowing, load, uh, charging their batteries, and then going down to the urban areas so that they have a regular supply of uh, energy. And it's, it's a, a program called Spot, which tells you, tells the drivers where the nearest uh, energy uh, battery is available for storage. Anyway, the general question is, what about wind? And how does that fit in with your general uh, philosophy? No, I, I agree that uh, I mentioned uh, at the beginning, at the end, that in terms of energy mix, there will be there won't be a magic bullet. There won't be a single kind of solution. So there will be a mix, and part of that mix will be wind as a renewable. Yeah, and I know that for I don't know what the figures are, but for certain weeks of the year. Um, Scotland can rely largely on wind in terms of wind. So yeah, it's part of that energy mix, and I, I agree. And once we get more and more um, wind energy, there'll, there'll be the increasing importance of energy storage as well, in terms of large scale energy storage. Um, I should add in terms of energy storage, I'm not saying that the batteries are the only energy storage solution. There are other energy storage aspects. There's pumped hydro, there's thermal, um, uh, my focus, obviously, my research area is to do with batteries, but there are other energy storage type devices or technologies. Adrian, along the road that you're just sitting on, please. Uh, the gentleman in the um, cardigan, or yeah, you had your hand up a moment ago. Yes. Thanks very much. Enjoyed your lecture. Could you recommend any companies that we should try and support? Uh, so, in, yeah, well, I mean, well, in the battery area, I mentioned sodium, fradian, and in the proskite solar areas, Oxford PV. Um, I don't think they're, I don't think they're publicly listed in terms of, but, um, yeah, I mean, the, on the, on our website, I, I won't go through the whole names, but on my the CAPMAP project I lead on the Faraday Institution CAPMAP project, we do list a, a range of industry partners. 
So I won't list them all, because that'll be, so, but on that, we do list a, very, a bunch of industry partners that are linked to our developments on lithium battery materials. Okay, I think our, our last two questions. If, first gentleman on the left. Cycle, as usual, very interesting lecture. <laughs> really enjoyed it. Just a couple of points I would like you to elaborate on. One, how big can you make lithium ion for, let's say, grid storage? And the other point is, could you pass a comment about fast charging, the impact the size on the lifetime of your lithium ion? I didn't catch the first part, the first question. Uh, how big do you think you can the lithium ion battery is getting to? Well, the, I mean, the way. Storage. Well, there isn't, I mean, a way it's to do with the resources. So they can be to the kind of megawatt, they can be the megawatt size. Um, and there have been, if you look at some Japan pilot studies in Japan and Australia, they have been linked to solar farms and some wind farms at so quite a large scale. The problem is cost, it's the cost aspect. So that's why I mentioned sodium. Sodium can go to that megawatt scale, but at a much lower cost. Uh, so that's where the, in terms of charging, yeah, I mean, there's the issue of, we would love to go into a service station or at home and charge our phones or our cars much faster. So that's what we're working on to try and boost the lithium ion conduction and get those faster charging. I also think about for long journeys, there's the, what I call the bladder break. There's gonna always, we always go to service station for a, a cup of tea or coffee and then charging in 15, 20 minutes, you can get to 80% charge quite rapidly. Um, you don't get to full charge, but you can get to 80%. So charging, you will get better um, with new developments and new faster charging materials. Uh, I have a question which kind of follows up from, from this. So you mentioned 80%. Sorry, just at the front. Eh? Sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned with electric vehicles, 80%. Uh, uh, is that likely to improve? At the moment, it's recommended 80% is the maximum recommended charge 80% of the capacity of the battery and then not discharging more than 10, 20, depending on the manufacturer yeah. recommendation. I suppose Is that likely to improve? Because at the moment we're losing- I can say yes. Uh, That's a good politic, yeah. Um, there will always be improvements, enhancements, yeah. Um, but remember it's 80% of what we have. So what I'm saying is that if the storage capacity increases, then 80% of that is much larger than before. So, uh, so I would say the energy density of the batteries will improve, and they have improved already. If you think about the first electric vehicles, the range might have been 50 kilometers. In fact, when I was growing up, the, the milk floats were terrible. They were just five kilometers. But now, you know, a, the modern Tesla could go much further. So I think the energy density, the storage capacity will improve which means 80% of that will improve as well. I'm not a battery engineer. I'm, I think the problem is charging to full. There are problems with degradation. So I mentioned that schematic of lithium ions going from positive electrode to the negative electrode. If you fully charge, I get all the lithiums to one side there are issues to do with degradation in getting the lithium ions back again to the other side. And that's why they don't charge fully. Okay, I think uh, we now have to finish the questions there. Thank you everybody for all the questions. Um, before I present uh, the medal, I'd just like to remind you that the next lecture, uh, which is being given by uh, Baroness Helena Kennedy on justice is is not on a Wednesday because she couldn't make it on the Wednesday. It's on Thursday, the 10th of November here in this lecture theatre. And I'll also just remind you that there's a glass of wine available in just a minute, but we've got <laughs> uh, some important business first. Can I just say one final thing? I have to thank all of you. Um, I, I have really enjoyed the q and I can't answer all the questions. I'm a humble materials chemist, so some of the more technical questions I can't quite grasp, but I'm, I'm actually really honored that the attendance has been full, 
the, you've stayed behind for the Q&A, so I'm really honoured. So thank you again for being around for this lecture. Thank you. Okay. So I, as you know, this is the Kelvin Medal. We heard a bit, thank you, about in the lecture about Lord Kelvin. Uh, he, of course, you mentioned you became a professor at 41. He became a professor at 22, Lord <laughs> Kelvin. <laughs> and he remained a professor for 53 years. So there's a record for you to... <laughs> 41 plus 53. To break there. Now, um, I think Lord Kelvin would have loved that lecture, of course. He himself was really interested in electricity. He was really also interested in industrial research as, as well as thermodynamics. So I think he would have really enjoyed it. The lecture was full of energy. It was full <laughs> uh, of excitement uh, and electricity. And that applies to the speaker as well as the lecture itself but also uh, humor, um, which was very engaging and made it altogether a wonderful lecture. I'm staying by the microphone here. So it's with great pleasure that on behalf of the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow, that I present you with the Kelvin Medal. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being uh, uh, And I'll also present him with a society paperweight. <laughs> so please, uh, please have a glass of wine. Uh, out there in the foyer and see you on the 10th of November. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, that's, uh, that's lovely. Uh, could, could I please also ask, just leave your 3D glasses at the front here.